Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. We've got a full lineup for the briefing, so we're going to just jump right in. Thank you for being with us today. I'm Charlotte Dodge, a government affairs manager here at the National Employment Law Project. And on behalf of everyone here at NELP, we welcome you to Workers Speak Out, a pro-worker vision for flexibility and work. At today's briefing, I'm pleased to share that you will have an opportunity to hear from Congressman Bobby Scott. Congressman Scott has represented the third congressional district of Virginia since 1993 and is currently the chairman of the House Education and Labor Committee. In that role, Congressman Scott has worked to advance an agenda that supports workers, starting with his leadership on career and technical education in our nation's high schools, up through retirement security for all seniors. He is the lead sponsor of the Raise the Wage Act, which would raise the minimum wage to $15 per hour and eliminate sub-minimum wages for tipped workers, youth workers, and workers with disabilities. We will also have an opportunity to hear pre-recorded remarks from Senator Elizabeth Warren. Senator Warren, representing Massachusetts since 2012, has been a courageous advocate for workers, families, and consumers during her time in the Senate. Senator Warner, Senator, excuse me, Senator Warren never backs down from holding corporations accountable and standing up for workers. We look forward to hearing more about Senator Warren's fair scheduling bill, the Schedules That Work Act, which provides workers with the stability and security they need to balance work with other real life responsibilities. We thank Senator Warren and Congressman Scott for their continued leadership and their support for this briefing. Other expert speakers at today's event include Rebecca Dixon, NELP's executive director and a national leader in federal workers' rights advocacy. Maya Pinto, a senior researcher and policy analyst here at NELP, who is the lead author of a recent co-branded report that shines a light on the anti-worker coalition for workforce innovation. David Weil, former administrator of the Wage and Hour Division at the US Department of Labor and professor at Brandeis University Heller School for Social Policy and Management. Our worker experts today include Sherry Murphy from Gig Workers Rising, Alvaro Bolinez from Rideshare Drivers United, Susie Young from SCIU Local 775, and Daryush Kodada Mubaraki from the California Gig Workers Union. These experts will share with us their vision for good jobs and true flexibility and why we must come together to push back against powerful corporate interests. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Rebecca Dixon from NELP to further kick off today's program. Rebecca. Thank you, Charlotte. Good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Dixon. I'm executive director here at the National Employment Law Project. Today's briefing comes as workers across this country, including the brilliant and courageous worker leaders that we have with us today, are in motion. A revitalized labor movement is seeing workers demand a voice at work, employer accountability, and good jobs. We've seen workers lead successful unionization efforts at major corporations like Amazon and Apple. Fast food workers for, from the Fight for 15 campaigns have won millions of dollars in wage increases. Workers leading fair work week campaigns have won fair schedules for millions of working people. Workers demanding true flexibility to take time off without having to give up pay have won paid sick and paid leave. This revitalization is inspiring and it's exciting. Of course, workers demanding and winning a stronger voice at work and true flexibility has not gone unnoticed by corporations. In 2019, a corporate lobbying group called the Coalition for Workforce Innovation emerged to undo these pro-worker gains and strip workers of minimum wage and other fundamental rights. Members of the coalition include Amazon, Apple, Uber, and many more corporations whose workers have been organizing for better conditions and more power. If the Coalition for Workforce Innovation has its way, unions, minimum wages, fair schedules, all of it will be obliterated. 
It's ironic that this group who has the word innovation in its name because it, its agenda is so blatantly regressive. It turns back the clock on workers' rights nearly 100 years back to before the New Deal. Thanks to worker organizing and worker ally support in the 1930s, the United States Congress passed the New Deal, a package of laws that established a foundational set of worker protections. Some of those laws included social security retirement benefits, unemployment insurance, a minimum wage, overtime pay, and the right to organize and bargain collectively. But as we know, and as I personally know from my family's history, the benefits of the New Deal were not available to all. My father was born in the New Deal era, he and his family and just about everyone that they knew were left out of these because of exclusions for agricultural and domestic workers. This deliberate decision to leave out agricultural and domestic workers meant that nearly half of all black men, Mexican American men and Native American men and women were left out plus significant numbers of Asian American workers as well. 90% of black women, yes, nine and 10 worked either as domestic or agricultural workers in the 1930s and they were excluded. And white workers, the majority of workers who were excluded, were fairly locked, unfairly locked out of the New Deal in huge numbers as well. When industries and occupations, categories of work are carved out of labor standards, workers suffer. Such exclusions have exacerbated wage gaps along race and gender lines. Rooting out these exclusions is critical to building an equitable good jobs economy for this country. So this brings us back to the Coalition for Workforce Innovation or CWI. The sprawling corporate coalition is working to exclude millions of workers from federal, state, and local protections. The CWI's agenda poses a threat to all working people in this country. Whether directly or indirectly, the erosion of labor standards that would result from stripping workers' minimum standards and safety nets would create a devastating race to the bottom dynamic across this country. Under the guise of innovation and flexibility, the CWI threatens to preserve and expand exclusions in the federal labor code, deplete social security systems and social insurance systems, and cement class, race, and gender inequality in the United States. In July of this year, the National Employment Law Project joined with the Service Employees International Union, Gig Workers Rising, Power Switch Action, and Temp Worker Justice to shine a light on the Coalition for Workforce Innovation and its anti-worker agenda. We released a port, report and a website that calls on Congress to follow the lead of workers who are organizing and demanding a voice at work, employer accountability, and good jobs. Our recommendation to members of Congress is to fight hard for pro-worker policies, such as the PRO Act, the Healthy Families Act, the Family Act, the Schedules That Work Act, and the Part-Time Workers Bill of Rights Act. These are important bills that would give workers real flexibility, economic security, and power, to strengthen organizing and bargaining rights, scheduling choice, and paid time off. By stark contrast, the CWI-backed Worker Flexibility and Choice Act, recently introduced in the House, codifies the false choice between flexibility and worker protections. The bill requires workers to sign away their rights in exchange for a mirage of scheduling flexibility. Alarmingly, this bill would strip workers of federal minimum wage and overtime protections. It would preempt hard won state and local wage, paid leave, unemployment insurance, and workers' compensation protections. The bill's true effect would be to give employers the flexibility to exploit workers with legal impunity. It must never become law. As we look ahead to the 118th Congress, we must follow the lead of workers in motion around this country and collectively fight back against these anti-worker corporate interests. Let's join together to advance a pro-worker vision for work and a good jobs economy. Today, you'll hear from a group of leaders, policymakers, workers, and former regulator about the work that we must do together. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Now I'd like to take a moment to welcome and introduce Congressman Bobby Scott, representing the third district of Virginia and current chairman of the House Education and Labor Committee. We're so pleased you're able to join us today and we really want to thank you and the entire Ed and Labor Committee staff for all that you do. So Congressman, I would like to turn it over to you for your remarks. Thank you. Well, thank you, Charlotte, and thank you for your kind introduction. It's a pleasure uh, to be with you today at today's briefing. 
For decades, NELP has been a critical partner to Congress's work to ensure that every American has an equal opportunity to succeed in a modern economy, and the 117th Congress was no exception. Two years ago, in December 2020, our nation's unemployment rate was almost 7%. And by December 2021, the unemployment rate had fallen to roughly 4%. And according to the most recent job reports, the unemployment rate is now down to about 3.7%, one of the, about the lowest uh, it's been uh, historically. And since uh, President Biden took office, the economy has added nearly 10 million jobs. That's the most in two years, I think, in the history of the United States. The recovery did not happen by accident. It is directly connected to your successful advocacy and the leadership of President Biden and congressional Democrats. We had several COVID-19 relief packages, including the CARES Act, and especially the American Rescue Plan Act, where Congress delivered support to help workers and their families pay their bills, stay safe on the job, and access health care. Notably, the CARES Act created three temporary unemployment insurance programs to help states provide expanded uh, UI benefits to help workers during the pandemic. These programs undoubtedly helped to prevent our economy from collapsing because it supported 53 million workers and put over $870 billion back into the economy. Unfortunately, the obstacles to implementing these programs and the historic surge and demand for assistance reaffirm the underlying challenges of inequities within the U.S. system. So instead of weakening or eliminating this critical program that has helped so many workers, as some Republican colleagues have suggested, we must confront these challenges and strengthen the U.S. system before the next crisis. Uh, through the American Rescue Plan, congressional Democrats invested in the Labor Department's ability to better administer U.I. benefits and additionally, the committee held a hearing in September to discuss ways Congress and the administration can make improvements to in the administration of the U.S. system. Now, of course, COVID-19 relief packages did not fix all of the outstanding and longstanding challenges that workers face. And that's why throughout the 117th Congress, the committee advanced key legislation to help workers provide for themselves and their families. In May, the committee reported the Wage Theft Prevention and Wage Recovery Act would go a long way ensuring that workers receive the full pay they have actually earned, as well as increasing penalties for employers who violate the law. That bill has been reported out of committee, but it hasn't gone uh, any further yet. And we, we need to get that all the way through the process so it will become law. Uh, but thanks to your advocacy, the House also passed twice the Protecting the Right to Organize Act, or the PRO Act, which would strengthen workers' collective bargaining rights by making the most significant upgrade to U.S. labor law in nearly 80 years. That while workers have achieved recent successes at uh, Amazon and Starbucks locations across the country, their stories are the exception, not the rule. The PRO Act would ensure that every worker has a right to join a union and organize for higher wages, better benefits, and safer workplaces. The committee has also uh, pushed to increase the NLRB's funding to ensure that the agency can support the rise in organizing efforts. And finally, we fought to ensure that the House passed version of the American Rescue Plan included the Raise the Wage Act. After 13 years without a federal minimum wage increase, this bill would raise the wages for about 33 million workers. Regrettably, both the PRO Act and the Raise the Wage Act remain held up in the Senate as we look ahead to the 118th Congress with Republicans in control of the House. Uh, regardless of political challenges that lay ahead in the 118th Congress, workers are still counting on us to protect their rights, strengthen workplace health and safety, and prepare them for the success in the modern for success in the modern economy. So accordingly, we must continue to fight for policy solutions that put the needs of workers and families first. And we must work together to prevent lawmakers and special interest groups from eroding the progress that we've made. So I wanna thank you again for inviting me this afternoon and look forward to working with you in the 118th Congress. Thank you, Congressman Scott. 
We appreciate your time with us today and of course your ongoing commitment to these issues. You're welcome to stay for the panel discussion, but please feel free to hop off if you have things you need to move on to. Thank you again for joining us today. Next, we will hear recorded remarks from Senator Elizabeth Warren. So please bear with us for just a moment so we can get those going. Hello, NELP, and thank you for inviting me. I sure wish I could be there in person, but I'm glad to be here virtually with all of you. It is an honor to stand with you all in the fight to create good, sustainable jobs and to protect our most vulnerable workers. Big tech companies like Uber and Lyft and Amazon have pushed the narrative that their business models of misclassifying workers as independent contractors instead of employees is somehow in workers' best interests. They say that for workers to get the flexibility they need, that they have to give up their rights to a minimum wage, to overtime pay, to collective bargaining, and more. But we know this is not true. Flexibility is already built into our laws so that workers have the room they need when they have kids or when someone they love gets sick or when life comes up. And Congress can do more. My Schedules That Work Act would shore up workers' rights to have more of a say in their schedules. My bill ensures that if workers want more flexibility to choose when they work, employers engage constructively and consider their requests fairly. But big tech doesn't really care about worker flexibility. They want to chip away at labor rights and squeeze workers just as hard as they can. Let's be clear, flexibility at work shouldn't come at the cost of workers' other fundamental rights. I'm in this fight all the way, and I'm glad that you are too. Together, I think we're gonna get this done. All right, we wanna thank Senator Warren and her team for putting that video together for us today. And we wanna thank her for a her commitment to these issues. I think with that, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Maya Pinto, who will be facilitating today's panel discussion. Take it away, Maya. Thank you, Charlotte. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to kick off a discussion with an extraordinary group of leaders here to talk about opportunities and challenges in the fight to expand workers' access to good jobs and to the rights and protections that help to ensure those good jobs. Sherry Murphy is a social justice minister, a Lyft driver, and a longtime organizer at Gig Workers Rising. She's based in North Carolina. Alvaro Belayanez is a ride hail driver and a longtime organizer at Rideshare Drivers United in California. Daryush Padadadi Mabarake is a ride hail driver and a member of the California Gig Workers Union. Susie Young is a caregiver and a founding member of SEIU Local 775 in Washington State. And David Weil is former wage and hour administrator at the US Department of Labor and a professor at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. He's also author of the seminal book on domestic outsourcing called The Fissured Workplace. Now to the audience, uh, if you have questions during the discussion, uh, please submit them using uh, the chat function in Zoom. Uh, if we have time, we'll get to them here. Otherwise, we'll follow up with you um, after the event. All right. So for starters, Sherry, Alvaro, and Daryush, I have a two-part question for you. What are some of the challenges ride hail drivers face on the job, especially in the aftermath of Proposition 22 in California? And then what lessons can workers and policymakers elsewhere in the US learn from what's been happening in California? We can start with Sherry and then go to Alvaro and then Daryush. Good afternoon. Thank you, Maya. Again, my name is Minister Sherry Murphy, social justice minister, also a gig worker rising, organizer, and former driver. From 2017 to 2020, right up until the pandemic, Lyft was my primary source of income, and I had driven over 12,000 miles. 
I was in my last year of my Master of Divinity and beginning to start my doctoral program. I needed something that was amendable, flexible to the life of a community minister and student. So in 2017, Lyft seemed like an answer, a godsend. They advertised a job with a feature of their so-called flexibility, which allowed me to make money along with loaning and car rental. However, over the years, I've seen many drivers become entrapped in the gig economy, where app workers found themselves in a constant cycle of living paycheck to paycheck, facing housing insecurity, or facing a deadly disease without proper protective equipment, injuries or death without benefits, protection or dignity. The signs of a false promise and the package of flexibility became painfully clear, and my views of Lyft were shifting. Both COVID-19 and the gig worker movement have pulled back the curtain and showed America's diseases for which there still is no vaccine. The lies around flexibility that are targeted toward low-income immigrants, Black and brown people, because there is nothing flexible about being harassed, verbally or physically assaulted, based on one's skin color, religion, or gender. There's nothing flexible about being denied workers' compensation in the middle of a pandemic. There's nothing flexible about not having designated restrooms when sitting in the car for 12 to 15 hours. There's nothing flexible about accepting poor working conditions out of fear of deactivation, or nothing flexible about not having a strong voice to speak to zero paid sick days, zero family leave, zero workers' compensation, disability insurance, or weakened health and safety protections. So what are the lessons that workers and policymakers elsewhere in the United States can learn from what's been happening here in California? You may ask. This model and their messengers, the Coalition for Workforce Innovation, are part of a historical expectation of workers who look like me. They are Trojan horses, wolves in sheep's clothing, eroding workplace, workplace power and labor standards that millions of underpaid workers have been fighting and winning for. In April of this year, Gig Workers Rising launched a report which focused on the failed responsibility of these gig companies to protect worker lives. Our research found that at least 50 gig workers have been murdered on the job since 2017. 60% of those workers are people of color. I leave you with this. Today, please consider their lives as testimony of the urgent safety crisis around corporate irresponsibility and the gig economy. Let their lives speak to a systemic and racist model. Let their lives speak to a growth at all cost model, which repeatedly ignores basic labor and wage protections but the most tragic cost of the business model are the loss of lives. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Sherry Alvaro. I think you're muted. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Alvaro and I'm a, I've been a ride chair uh, driver for the past eight years. I've been fighting with this um, corporation for the past eight years, I would say by myself. And now I'm part of Righteous Drivers United. I've been part with them for the past four years. So they've been helping me fight with these companies, with these corporations. And what I want people to, to learn from us in California is that this is United States. It costs $220 million for this corporation to create their own law. What they did, they pretty much pay everybody. They pay People, I, I, I still remember seeing people outside the supermarkets getting signature. And I will ask these people, how much are you getting paid? And they said that Lyft, Uber, all these app-based uh, companies were paying them from $4 to $12 per signature. Because in order for them to put the ballot initiative in the, into both, they needed 600 signatures. So it, it was all about like money. I have money. I can create my own law. So I can I can uh, uh, take advantage of the you know the hardworking people. This is what this is what's happening right now in California. If you have money, you can create your own law. You can buy your own law. This is why it's so important for us to have a tool, something at the at the federal level that is gonna make our job our job a little bit easier to 
to fight with this corporation because I feel that they have a wall, a concrete wall, and I'm just hitting it without no tool. I need like a, like a hammer. This is why I was hoping for the, for the PRO Act to give us, to be the tool that was gonna help us organize, to, to, that was gonna help us unionize, to have a voice on the job, a seat on the table. Because like yesterday, yesterday I got the new term and survey from Liz. I was doing right the Turner service showed up and he says you have to accept this term and service if you want to keep on driving I don't want to be short on my rent I wanted to pay my bills do you think I'm a lawyer do you think I'm going to understand 50 to 100 pages term and service contract I'm not going to understand that so what are all the options I have I have to sign that to keep on driving I personally went to LAX lab where all the righteous drivers are before Thanksgiving. I spoke probably with a hundred drivers. Guess how many drivers were gonna take Thanksgiving off? None of them. They were all told me that they, were, they have to drive during Thanksgiving because otherwise they were gonna be short on rent. They, they, they were not gonna have money to pay their bills. So, and in, in, in these companies are saying that we have flexibility. What type of flexibility is that that you cannot even take Thanksgiving off? That's not, a, that's not flexibility. I spoke to a lot of drivers who are living in their cars, who are driving more than 100 hours a week. You call that flexibility. If I have to drive 100 hours a week, that's not flexibility. You're just, you're just killing yourself. It's really sad. I have a Facebook group with 13,000 drivers. I've seen a lot of times people posting uh, a GoFundMe pages because the driver was killed by a drone driver. The driver was, was killed by a passenger. Their family has to create a GoFundMe page just to cover the, the, their funeral expenses. This is not acceptable. We need to do something about it. These big corporations, like I said, just because they have money, they think that they can create their own laws. Us workers and what they're doing, what they're doing is trying for us to make less and less and less money so they can manipulate us. I'm not gonna give you guys a really good example. So I went before Thanksgiving, I went to the right share lot at LAX and I spoke to a lot of drivers. I told drivers, let's go offline on Sunday after Thanksgiving because that's one of the busiest day at LAX because everybody's coming back from vacation. I told everybody, let's turn off the app. We have the power. Guess what the corporations did? They decided to add five extra dollars per trip Ford coming out of from LAX. You, you know how many drivers they have there online? 500 drivers. So they, they, they have created an algorithm that manipulate us, that control us. So the less money we make, the easier it is for them to control us. Because if I'm short, if I'm short on rent, if I cannot pay my rent and, this, and these people throw me a, a few extra bucks, I am gonna listen to them and I'm not gonna go out and drive. So we've been controlled by an algorithm. The algorithm control us. The algorithm dictates where they want me to be at. The algorithm dictates where, if Uber wants me to be at downtown LA, they just say, Alvaro, here are an extra $5, go to, go to downtown. And I will go because I need that money, because I'm not making enough money. Do you think I have, do you think I can, I can take Christmas off, New Year's? I cannot take those days off. I cannot even take a, a, a weekend off to be with the family because I'm not gonna be short on rent. I won't be able to pay my bills. Like I said, there's a lot of people, live, a lot of drivers living in their cars because they cannot afford to pay the rent. This is why they're living in their car. I, have, I know a lot of drivers who go to the truck stop and take a shower there. This is happening right now. And this is the United States. It's, it's sad. It's really sad what's happening out there. This is why it's so important for, for us to have a tool like the PRO Act, like I mentioned it before. We need something that is gonna help us fight with these big corporations because they're untouchable. Just because they have money, they think that nobody can touch them. I feel like all the laws at the local level and at the state level, all the laws, they're buying them left and right under the table. This is why we need something at the federal level, a law that will, that will dictate 
how these big corporations operate. Because it's not, it's, not, it's not fair. It's not fair that these big corporations are making billions and billions of dollars. I still remember during the pandemic, I was hoping, I was hoping for these big corporations that they were going to save me at, uh, at least at least a hundred dollar bonus during during the, the pandemic. They didn't even save me one dollar. This is what they did send me though. They sent me an email saying, they sent me an email saying we we were talking to the White House with the president, and the president decided to create the PUA, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. So instead of the White House, instead of the Congress, instead of the Senate, force these companies to actually put money into the regular unemployment, they decided to bail them out with the PUA. And that's all I got. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you so much, Alvaro, for sharing that. Um, Daryush? Hi, good morning for those uh, in the Pacific region, uh, Pacific time, and uh, good afternoon to rest in other places. My name is Dariush Khodada Di Mubarake, and I live in San Jose, California. I'm a member of California Gig Workers Union, along with thousands of other gig workers who are trying to form a union. I've been driving for gig companies since 2014. I've done ride share for Uber and Lyft and food delivery with Grubhub, Uber Eats and Postmates. Like many immigrants, driving for gig companies is my main source of income. Many of us are drawn to this work because the companies make it easy to sign up. There are promises of bonuses and flexibility as well. But many of us who are new to America or who don't speak English are also easy targets for these companies. Because we may not speak English or are afraid to get, in tr to get in trouble, we are not able to speak up. Whether that's for being unjustly kicked off the gig platforms so that we can't drive for work anymore or for decent wages or protections that we need to be safe on the job. Many gig drivers came to America to live a better life and provide more opportunities for our families. But gig companies take advantage of our hope. Opportunity has made it easier for gig corporations to not pay their workers a minimum wage or pay sick days among benefits. On top of that, gig corporations push the cost of their business to us drivers. And we have only seen our pay go down over the years. One awful as it violates California State's constitution. But gig corporations like Uber and Lyft continue to fight the courts, courts ruling, and instead of paying us better or making sure we have bene better benefits, the corporations are spending that money to block us from accessing basic protections like workers' compensation. I look forward to when the unconstitutional law that's Prop 22 is gone. I urge the lawmakers to look at what gig drivers are facing when laws like Prop 22 take away our rights and opportunities for lives with dignity. Thank you, Thank you so much, Daryush, um, and Sharon sure. Alvaro. Um, Susie and David, um, I have a, a two-part question for you as well. Um, can you please uh, talk about the work that you do and the impact of non-employee labor models on sectors beyond ride hail? And uh, can you share with us your reaction to what the Coalition for Workforce Innovation is trying to do nationwide? Well, I'm happy to start, Maya. Thank you sure, uh, thanks. for inviting me. Um, and I could tell you um, my perspective on uh, thinking about the issues that um, my co-panelists have just so articulately put out there uh, and, and described in, in, in very real terms um, comes from both studying evolving business organizations in our economy and the increasing use of different forms of outsourcing to 
shed a lot of the responsibilities that historically we have given to employers uh, along all the lines that have just been described. Um, but it also comes from the honor of serving in the Obama administration, as you mentioned, as the wage and hour administrator, or the wage and hour division at the Department of Labor, where I saw firsthand um, the kinds of violations that were just described. And what I wanna start by emphasizing is while we're seeing these kinds of practices rampant in the platform economy, and particularly with companies like Uber and Lyft and DoorDash and others, um, these problems are industry-wide, are economy-wide. Um, we have had an evolution of businesses where more and more businesses, um, while on one hand, very carefully control the services or the products they're providing, on the other hand, have been through a variety of mechanisms, been able to shed their responsibilities for employment. And, and they do that in the platform world in ways we just heard described, but we see it also in different forms of subcontracting, uh, third-party management, uh, sometimes in forms of franchising, where companies shed those responsibilities and workers who are actually doing the work, who are delivering the products, who are picking people up and getting them to where they wanna go, um, are classified as independent contractors. And because they're classified as independent contractors, they lose all of the protections that we have carefully built through decades of legislation at the federal and state and local level to provide those protections. It's a sleight of hand that is affecting workers across the economy and has led to the growing inequality we're seeing uh, in the labor market and the greater uh, exposure workers have to all kinds of downside risks. Um, what we're seeing particularly in the, in the legislation that um, uh, is being de described and is being uh, promoted by this so-called coalition for worker innovation um, is really a, a, a very nasty form of of making those kinds of conditions, making those kinds of ways of shedding responsibilities um, easier to do. Um, this is nothing really new. Um, really the logic that underlies this, this legislation, uh, the Workforce Flexibility and Choice Act, as it is uh, called, and um, it, I would say very cynically named, um, goes back to something called the Lochner decision in 1905, where the Supreme Court way back more than 117 years ago, blocked worker protections under the guise that workers should be given the freedom to contract on them uh, among themselves. And even the proponents of this new bill use that kind of language in defending taking away these rights and responsibilities from workers in describing the legislation. Um, there is in their own promotion of the act, they say that under the current classification framework, there is no opportunity for workers to voluntarily assert their independence. That's a quote. It's this idea that we need to free workers to make their own choices, oh, unencumbered by things like minimum wage, overtime, protections against discrimination and harassment, workers' compensation, and all the other issues that my co-panelists have raised. Um, this is an old effort. It's being dressed up in new ways, and its consequences are significant. Um, uh, and very severe. The last thing I, I would just say is that, and going back to my first point, I, if you look at the coalition um, that has come together to promote this work and other work to roll back worker protections, um, it's not just Ubers and Lyfts of the world, although they're involved in it, but it's also major corporations like Amazon and Walmart, and in the excellent report that NELP has created about uh, CWI, you'll see it's a cross section of companies that are all trying to unwind these protections um, that workers uh, and, and advocates, unions, uh, and people like Congressman Scott, Senator Warren have, have fought so hard to put in place. Um, and that's why it is such a dangerous initiative uh, and, and effort that we need to be aware of. 
Thank you, David. Thanks for that. And Susie? Good afternoon. My name is Susie Young, and I'm an in-home care provider and an executive board member of SEIU 775 from Washington, Spokane, Washington. My union represents 45,000 long-term care workers in Washington State and Montana, and I have been working as an in-home care provider for the disabled, the elderly, and the most vulnerable members of my community for more than 35 years. The work I do is difficult, but I also love it. In-home care is health care. We bathe and feed our clients, coordinate appointments with doctors and other specialists, notice changes in our clients' health, and do almost everything that our clients can't do for themselves. But for decades, laws like the Fair Labor Standards Act didn't even recognize us as an employee. We were seen as companions, and worse, not seen at all. Taking care of the elderly and developmentally disabled can be challenging work but it became a good job, a good career, when we organized and became part of our union. Today, unionized in-home care workers have decent pay, health benefits and trainings to help us deal with the increasingly complex mental and health issues of our clients that our clients are facing. In Washington state, we also recently passed a law against the harassment, abuse and discrimination that many in-home care workers have endured while on the job because of the vulnerable environment that we work in, in people's homes, sometimes with others, mostly family members. But I urge lawmakers to remember that in-home care is health care and it is about people. Our clients need consistency because I know my clients, I'm aware when I walk in the door, if the client sounds more confused, it could be a lack of oxygen because the cat chewed on the oxygen line the night before. True story. As more Americans are aging, we need more workers to go into this field, but making it easier for companies to wash themselves of their responsibilities to pay and protect their workers isn't the answer. It wasn't until 2015 that in-home care workers, often women, mostly black women, indigenous women, immigrant women, and women of color who do this difficult work of caring for people in their homes. But in 2015, we were finally covered under the Fair Labor Standards Act, giving us the basic protections that most other workers have. In Washington state, it wasn't until 2003 that in-home care workers won the right to bargain for better pay, benefits, and trainings that help us improve client care with the union. Then and only then were we recognized as workers with rights. We are no longer considered independent contractors or companions. Before our union, we had no protections. If you got hurt on the job, there was no workman's compensation, L and I. We had no health insurance. Back in the 90s, I took care of several HIV clients. I had to fight for a box of gloves. Remember, this is before our union. And during this time, I heard that school crossing guards got gloves. But here I am working in healthcare, and I had to fight for a box of gloves. It was just so unjust. Again, before we were organized into our union, we felt invisible and totally disrespected. I remember many conversations with coworkers whose paychecks were shorted, and then they had to turn to the food banks to feed their families. Back then, you had to wait at least two weeks for paycheck corrections. Today, it is less than two days. But being part of our union and fighting for the rights, protections, and benefits that employees are entitled to changed all that. We're not going to solve the crisis of short staffing in healthcare by making it more difficult for caregivers to protect themselves from abuse. There is no innovation in going back to a time when caregivers like me had, to, had a few ways to fight back against wage theft. There were zero options for a chance at a dignified retirement and had to go without a safety net for when we got hurt on the job. We have fought too hard, too long to go backwards. I think that all workers for the policymakers going forward, I think that all workers should have basic labor protections, including the right to a minimum wage, access to workers' compensation, the right to paid sick and family leave, and the ability to join together with their coworkers in a union. People should have that right. We need to pass the PRO Act. Lawmakers should make it easier for workers to be able to bargain collectively with their employers. By being able to join together in a union, Caregivers are not only able to secure better wages and benefits, but also 
raise the standards of care for our clients and our patients. A good place to start would be to reject the Worker Flexibility and Choice Act, which takes away fundamental rights for workers. There is no flexibility or choice when workers are misclassified and trapped by companies into poverty without a way to fight back against exploitation. So moving forward, we need to improve workers' rights, not take them away. We really need to um, help other workers to form unions, and we will work with anyone who wants to advance pro-worker policies past the pro, PRO Act. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Susie. And now I have a question actually for all the panelists um, building off um, calls for the PRO Act that Susie and Alvaro and others have made. Um, what actions would you like to see federal policymakers and regulators take to ensure that all workers in this country have access to good jobs? And we can start with Sherry and just go down the line in the order that we just spoke in. Thank you. So I'm really hopeful about the leadership of, of President Biden, uh, leaders who are putting workers' lives in front of greedy profits. So the, despite the threats of the gig economy to take uh, the Proposition 22 model nationwide, um, the new administration is very receptive about proposition opposing Proposition 22, uh, which speaks to the epidemic of uh, misclassification. Um, and I think the PRO Act can help do that. Um, the pride, the fighting, the protecting right to organize that. It gives us a right for dignity, uh, real flexibility and real protections and fair protections, a right to join a union. Uh, it gives worker movements who are fighting, ha fighting hard for initiatives that close the wealth, equity and, and gender gap. I I'm hopeful um, around those particular measures and similar ones. Thank you, Sherry. And Alvaro? Yeah, same, same as what Sherry said. I'm, I'm hoping for the PRO Act to pass because um, like I said, we, we, need to, we need to have a clear path that is gonna, is gonna allow us to, to unionize, to organize, to have, to have a voice on the job, to have a seat on the table. And, and also, um, I don't know if it's possible to create a law that is gonna, is gonna force the state at the state level to to um to force these companies to obey the law, for example, like in California, we're trying to overturn Prop 22. I, I'm wondering what's going to happen if we overturn overturn Prop 22. How how everything is going to play out? Because if we overturn overturn Prop 22, AB5 comes into place. How the state is, are going to force these companies to obey the law? And and like I said. Right now, these companies tend to kind of like drag everything, you know, take it to Supreme Court. Let's take it to here, here, because that the more time they gain, the more the more options that are open up for them, you know, to to misclassify us. Thank you. And are you? Yeah, lawmakers must see through the gig corporations' false promises of flexibility as they push for laws that take away protections for gig workers. There is no flexibility when you have to work more than two hours a day, six days a week, just so that you can put food on the table. There's no flexibility when you get hurt while driving for these com companies and then have no way to pay out your rent because you don't have access to workers' compensation. The solution to making sure that everybody has everyone has access to good jobs is by making sure that all workers, including gig workers, gig drivers like me, can join together in a union. With a union, workers like me can say what it really means to have flexibility on the job. The union, we have a voice on our jobs and a way to earn better wages and benefits. Thanks. Thank you, Daryush and David. Yeah, um, well, I, I think I would start by um, picking up something that um, Susie Young mentioned, and that's the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, the Fair Labor Standards Act, let me give you a short, medium and long term uh, response to your, your question. Um, in the short term, the Fair Labor Standards Act provides basic protection for minimum wage and overtime uh, for workers. 
Uh, it's a fundamental law. It's a fundamental protection. Um, I was proud to be in the Obama administration as part of the effort to expand the FLSA's coverage to home care along with allies like NELP and SEIU mm -hmm. um, uh, because that is a fundamental protection. In the short term, we have to make sure that FLSA is protected. And there are two things that um, uh, members of the congressional staff should be aware of. Number one is there is a proposed rule um, that is out right now that the Labor Department has put out that brings back the definition clearly of employment versus independent contracting back to the definition the Labor Department and the Wage and Hour Division have used for decades that, that judges have understood and articulated. And it is a definition of employment that is basic and broad to the Fair Labor Standards Act and that the Trump administration tried to roll back. Um, the rule proposed by President Biden, Secretary Walsh, um, brings us back to the kind of coverage um, that the, the act describes and that courts have recognized. Um, the final rule, comments on the proposed rule are due December 13th. The final rule will be issued after that. It's really important that people support the, the spirit of that rule so we keep those fundamental protections. Also in the short term, and I speak from this from direct experience, the Wage and Hour Division, OSHA, uh, the Office of the Solicitor, and the NLRB need the resources to enforce the laws that are on the book. And unfortunately, Republican opposition in the appropriations project uh, process have starved all of those agencies, going back to the 2014 and before, of the resources they need to do enforcement to make sure that workers have those fundamental rights. Again, that is a short-term essential thing that needs to be addressed in the appropriations process critically now. Um, in the medium term, my co-panelists have said it, we have great legislation out there that would extend benefits. The PRO Act is, is, a, is a crucial way of expanding collective bargaining rights to, to working people and making sure that the definition of employment isn't used or people can slip out of, of, of employment status to get out of those responsibilities. But equally in the mid midterm uh, in medium term, flexibility is about workers being able to take paid sick days and, and leave when they need it. Uh, we need those kinds of federal assurances um, like the, the Healthy Families Act provides uh, paid leave through the Family Act and the scheduling protection protections that Senator Warren talked about. And then I think in the long term, we have to get back to the basic issues that workers, regardless of employment status, should be assured of certain basic protections on the job, like the minimum wage, like being assured uh, that they won't be sexually harassed or discriminated against at the workplace, and that they'll come home safe at the end of the day. I think we have to work in the long term to really make sure those fundamental protections are available to all workers, regardless of status. Absolutely, thank you, David. And Susie? Um, I guess I just have to think, I mean, hearing these horrific stories, I lived it. I lived at that time where we didn't have any rights at all. But one of the key values that we have at 775 at SEIU here in Washington state is persistence. That is our key word is persistence and never give up, just be relentless because it's so easy to give up. The fight is hard and you just keep getting battered down, but you gotta keep fighting. And for years, we didn't give up. You gotta right, you gotta elect the right people in office. I do know that, but we gotta be persistent and not give up and I've seen the good that has come out of it. I've seen workers lifted out of poverty. I have seen workers today for the first time in their lives to be able to buy a home. I don't care if it's a little home, but they got a home. Um, and finally getting respect. You know, years ago, I remember asking workers, what would you like to see? I'm a worker myself. But what was the one thing that they wanted? You know what they said? Respect. It wasn't always about the money, it was respect. Just see me as a worker. So I think going forward, never give up, have that persistence attitude, and you gotta be able to form unions. You gotta be able to join together in the PRO Act and just keep moving forward. 
it is hard for me to think in this day and age that we're talking about going backwards. I've worked so hard in this state with other workers to go forward. And now nationally, you're talking about going backwards? Like, what the hell? Anyway, persistence is the key word. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Susie. Thanks to all the panelists for sharing your insights and your wisdom and this call to action. I'm gonna turn it over to Charlotte now. Thank you, Maya. And to Sherry, Alvaro, David, Susie, and Daryush, that was so powerful. Thank you all for sharing your experiences and perspectives with us. We really appreciate your time today. Before we close, I just wanna take a moment and lift up a few important things for this audience. As David touched on during the panel, the Department of Labor published a proposed rule that would ensure that all people who work for someone else are covered by our federal minimum wage and overtime laws. And we ask you to submit comments in support of this rule so that all working people have access to basic labor rights and protections. Please reach out to us at NELP if you would like our support in submitting these comments. As we look ahead to the 118th Congress, we must follow the lead of workers and advocates to come together and collectively fight back against anti-worker federal policies like the Worker Flexibility and Choice Act. Together, we must create opportunities to advance pieces of legislation and policy like the PRO Act and the Schedules That Work Act that advance a pro-worker vision for work and flexibility. We invite you to join us as we work together to advance this vision. You can learn more about the Coalition for Workforce Innovation and about a pro-worker policy agenda at www.thetruthaboutcwi.org. And lastly, we really do wanna hear from you in your office. Please reach out to, to us at cdodge at nelp.org. We will be sending around follow-up materials to everyone that registered, including a link to a recorded version of today's briefing. Thank you again for joining us and to all the speakers.